So good evening, everyone. I'm um, Joe White, and uh, I'm welcoming here you here to another edition of A Life in the Arts. And uh, with me are Peggy Gould, dancer and educator, and Todd Whitley, who is the uh, executive director of the Masterwork Music and Art Foundation. And so we're going to begin by letting Todd do his 30-second commercial. <laughs> Take it away, well, Todd. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, the Masterwork Music and Art Foundation has been around for over 60 years, contributing to excellence in the arts in a number of ways. And today, um, we offer three different levels of grants. One is a premier award, a 10,000 gift to an artist or an art maker. Um, then we have community arts grants that go out to organizations. And then we have competitive awards. We also have some free classes we offer online. And this series here, Life in the Arts, where we celebrate people who have dedicated their lives to the arts in various ways. And tonight, we're so fortunate to have Peggy Gould with us, a wonderful human being and an incredible artist and um, someone I've admired for a long time. So with that, Joe, take it away. Okay. And all right here, hold on. I'm going to make, oh, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I don't, okay, are you, are you going to turn off your video, Todd? there and what i ah there we go that lets me do this and change the view to that so anyway uh someday i will learn zoom uh probably about the time that we're done with these uh but anyway so i um this you know i i was looking todd prepared some questions and we'll sort of use them as a jumping off point, but I, you know, don't ask me to be all that careful about keeping to them. Um, the, um, so you are someone, uh, dancers, um, unfortunately share with professional athletes, a, the fact that your body is what's doing the talking. And that uh, when you're young and you've trained and trained and trained and trained, uh, your body can do certain things. And as one gets older, you can do different things. Um, but one of the, I, I, you know, I think your path is a really great one that, you, you know, you've really moved into contributing your knowledge and wisdom about this whole process to other people. Um, I guess the other path that a lot of people take is choreography. Uh, but if you have a dance company of 30 people, you probably there only going to be one or two of them get to do that. <laughs> so it's really wonderful to, uh, to see this be one of the things that we are about masterwork is about is trying to help young artists affect the a different transition, which is the transition from student to professional. And that's the purpose of our large grant uh, every year uh, is to help someone or a some group uh, make that move. And um, and part of the whole thing was to make sure that we were giving enough money that it actually would make a difference. And so it's a ten thousand dollar grant. And but at any rate, um, the so as somebody who's made that transition and then made yet this other transition into what you do after, um, the only person I know who ever managed to not have to make the trans, but she was already a choreographer, is Martha Graham, who I did see at age 80 actually dance, sort of. <laughs> and, um, but, um, at any rate, um, that's really quite inspiring and, and really wonderful that you've been able to do that. But let's go back to the, the actually before the first one. When did you know and how did you know that this was what you wanted to do in your life? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, there were different moments of knowing. 
starting at the very, very beginning, um, I think I sent you some photographs, including one of a very young child in a dance studio. <clears throat> I, with, you know, you may so have done older that. Children, I... Older children and a dance teacher. Anyway, when I was two and a half, my mom enrolled my sister, who was five at the time, in a creative dance class. And it was at our at a community arts center, not not too far from our home in Pennsylvania. And so we all went the first week. And the first week I stood outside the studio door and watched. And then the next week I stood inside the studio door and watched. And by the third week, I was participating and the teacher said, well, she seems to be following along. It's fine with me if if she stays. Mm -hmm. And so I think I sort of crashed my sister's dance class as a very young person. And, and um, I felt uh, extremely interested in it. And I felt like, oh, I can do this. I'm I'm interested. I, I, I like this. Mm -hmm. And so that was a kind of initial toddler view of ah dancing yeah that seems good <laughs> the so. um, yeah i it, that's interesting because i we had well first of all that's one of the various scenes of, of improv in a chorus line and i say that we we had interviewed uh last summer uh, we'd, uh, we'd interviewed one of the original cast and he had a similar story to tell that it was, I think it was his sister <laughs> and, uh, and that's how he wound up in there. But, um, so this seems to so, be something I that think, happens. Yeah, I think, I think it does happen that you have, um, you know, the good fortune to be exposed to dancing or music or painting or theater, um, <clears throat> at a young enough age that it, it captivates you in a, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Oh, I should mention that was Robert Lupone, uh, oh, Patty, Patty's wonder. brother, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who alas is no longer with us. And, um, uh, but it was really great to get a chance to talk to him. Um, wow. Yeah. Anyway. So you know, um, <clears throat> I always was taking dance classes. And when I was, I think when I turned six, um, my parents learned of a school in downtown Philadelphia um, that was being run by a gram dancer named Nadia Cholkovsky Nahumik. And Nadia was a Russian uh, uh, emigre who mm -hmm. came to the clinic came to the U.S., studied with Martha Graham, and also uh, was a teacher of Laban notation, which okay. is a system of dance notation, written dance notation. So uh, my parents brought me to meet her and to, you know, sort of uh, kind of audition, I guess. And at that point, I was... Um, invited to come into the adults class on Saturdays. So I was this very little kid who had a lot of attention for dancing and we were learning Graham technique and we were also learning Laba notation. Mm. So around the same time that I was learning, uh, uh, you know, multiplication, long division, first grade, second grade, I was learning Laba notation. It was, a, 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 and it had a big influence on me in terms of um, uh, paying attention to movement from an analytical point of view, where it mm -hmm. starts, where it stops, what's the musical. So, um, so that was sort of a second piece where I got to be, working at a kind of a high level, but I was little, I could follow along and I was able to, mm -hmm. you know, keep up. And so I, I did that from age six until I, I did take a break. Um, I think I was probably 12 and then, um, about three years later went back for another few years and, high school, I divided my time between uh, going to high school just outside of the, the city of Philadelphia and a and, um, couple days a week, I would go in and take class. And 
Then I went to um, college. My uh, first college experience was to go to Tufts University. Okay. And in my fall semester, I'm looking at the course catalog, figuring out what to register for, and I'm seeing dance classes. And I thought, you what? Dance? You can take dance in college? So right away, I was taking dance classes. I studied with Judith Alter and Kristen Beckwith. And it was um, after three semesters, I had a, there was a choreographer who was teaching at Tufts named Paula Josa Jones. And Paula said to me at the end of the fall semester, would you want to dance with my company? And I thought, and I said to her, what, what, like a job? And she said, yes. Yep. <laughs> I had never contemplated such a thing. I, I, I barely even knew that people really did that. And there were no artists in my family. And I said, yes. So I, I left school <laughs> and I began to dance with Paula and stayed in Boston for about four years, four and a half years, just dancing with lots of different choreographers, the Opera Company of Boston and various choreographers. And um, at a certain point, I realized I, I needed more solid training and I wanted to go to New York. And um, I auditioned for Juilliard and for Tisch NYU School of the Arts. And mm -hmm. I didn't get into Juilliard, but I was accepted um, with great support uh, at Tisch. Mm -hmm. um, the director of the program was Larry Rhodes, who was a very wonderful um, ballet teacher and a ballet dancer. And so I worked really closely with him for three years. And from there, you know, I just, I never stopped working. Well, no, that's, uh, well, it's wonderful that someone saw who you would be and said, come work with me. Yeah. That's... Yeah, that was that was a huge turning point. And I yeah. think you're right. For young people, you know, the the um constituency that your your organization works with trying to, you know, um reach young people at a at a moment in their lives, it is a key thing to have someone see you. Yeah. And and see who who you could be. And um, it's a very lucky thing when that happens. And, uh, it and it does require luck. It doesn't, you know, uh, one wonders how many people, how many wonderful people never get to, you know, to do that. But um, the, so. Well, I uh, think it's, you know, sorry, just to say, Joe, one more thing about that. It is luck and it's also structural where you know there are certain things structurally in our society that afford access mm. to the experience of studying various artistic practices and that i think is not so much luck as a kind of commitment on the part of the public to to make art available right. to everyone yeah, and to make the instruction available, and to make the the path to to professional. Well, we try in our own little way to do that. Uh, Todd has a wonderful thing from your website, which I will I'd like to share. Uh, yeah. In every moment of life, we are changing. We can positively influence the process of change using our intelligence to pursue movement goals. And that ties it to your particular area, but it could be said of any of the arts, actually of any of the sciences as well. It's Absolutely. And, and success is that that meeting of luck and preparedness. Absolutely. Because if the luck is there, but the preparedness isn't, well, gee, sorry. Um, but at any rate, I so the... Um, so you've given I, I'm, I'm looking at his questions, looking for where where to go next. But I, you know, so you worked as a professional dancer and I still do, actually, I, I you know, I, I haven't actually finished performing. I haven't given up performing. I think, you know, the 
when the pandemic happened, I was in rehearsal with Bill T. Jones for the piece that he eventually made in New York at the Park Avenue Armory for a hundred dancers. Mm. Um, and it was a really wonderful project, but um, it got closed down. And then <clears throat> when they remounted it, I had a knee injury and I couldn't do it. But right. I'm, you know, steadily rehabilitating and reclaiming my ranges of motion. And, you know, I teach technique three days a week. I'm in the studio. I'm jumping. I'm going to the floor. So I think, you know, the the, the performing will be ongoing, I think, in certain ways. Hope it's so. not the yeah. only thing. It's not the only thing I do. I spend a, a lot of time teaching now. So I have a full time teaching appointment at Sarah Lawrence. And yes, yeah, well, no, that's down here. If I look down his list of questions, you know, you've been there for over 20 years and yes, I, I looked have. at your CV and um, it's long um, and lots and lots of academic stuff um, and uh, which Again, I I think it's particularly wonderful when people in the arts can. It's not just that you need to find something to do when you're not the lead dancer anymore, but it's also that you know stuff that other people need to know, and right. this is a it's just a wonderful opportunity to share that, um, which um, that's. Again, luck meeting, meeting preparedness. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, when um, when I finished my degree at uh, NYU, um, I had uh, in my time there gotten very interested in functional anatomy because it had made such a huge difference in my own technique. So where I began to be able to master and really advance in my own technical work coincided with um, studying functional anatomy with Andre Bernard and studying Alexander technique with Clarice Marshall, as well as learning Pilates, but and and, and just dance all the time and being trained by amazing teachers. But I think these things were very key in terms of um, uh, clearing away some of the some of the obstacles to um, my being able to master high level classical and neoclassical technique. Mm. Well, I so, think. I no, go ahead. Just, just to say, I, 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 as a child, it was all Graham for me. I never really got interested in ballet until I was at Tufts. And then it took a while. And it wasn't until I was at Tisch that I started to really be able to make use of that technique through the study of functional anatomy in a, in a big way. Um, so, you know, just, just to finish that thought that um, when I left, uh, uh, when I graduated from Tisch, um, I continued to be very interested in functional anatomy and had the opportunity to um, take a workshop with Irene Dowd, who is a very renowned functional anatomist um, and dance educator who um, teaches at the Juilliard School. And I began to study with her and um, taking her anatomy classes and really getting interested and, in, you know, sort of taking them over and over again. At a certain point, I said, you know, I feel like I just need to keep coming to your class, you know, because there's so much more to learn. And she said, well, you know, that's called being my assistant. OK. <laughs> and it, it took me a couple of years and then I think three years after she said that to me, I called her up and I said, you know that thing you said about being your assistant? Like, and she said, well, I've been waiting for you to call. Okay. So, mm. And so that was when I began assisting her and that following that interest, that enduring interest for me in functional anatomy as it related to dancing and dance performance, um, was the thing that ultimately, when the job opened up at Sarah Lawrence, um, my the the new director of the dance program there was Sarah Rudner, who I knew and I danced with. And Sarah wanted my mentor, my teacher, Irene, to come to Sarah Lawrence to teach anatomy. And Irene wasn't free to do that because of her commitments at Juilliard. So Irene recommended me. 
And that was in 1999. And it really was, like you say, opportunity is preparedness. And I think, you know, what I always try to remember is that preparedness has to do with making sure that you're following your curiosity. Follow Mm. the things that really speak to you. Learn about those. What do you need to know? What do you want to know about the things that really captivate your thinking, your imagination, your curiosity? In that sense, I was prepared for that opportunity because I was so deeply, deeply interested in that functional anatomy work. Well, I was going to say also that you, that not this, not the Sarah Lawrence, but in the before with Irene, that was another example of somebody seeing who you could be. Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and then plus seeing that you could, be that it's be what you are at Sarah and Lawrence, which is um, I think the f- folks there are very happy to you know should be very very they're lucky to have you. At it's any rate, been I'm, a great, it's been a great partnership, really a great a, a great mutually beneficial. And I think the the other thing I you know I I went to uh, you know I would do dance classes in when I was trying to train to be an actor uh this is many many years ago like as in about 65 years ago uh but at any rate i um i think that the you know and i don't know functional anatomy but it sounds like something i should look into because it i felt frequently that we were just sort of doing rote stuff and I think it would have been really useful to kind of understand how the internals were working to do that stuff. So I think that's... Yes, I think it is actually extremely empowering mm-hmm. for for performers, for athletes, for individuals in various stages of life. You know, one of the things that I've done in addition to teaching in the in the academic setting, the university and college setting is that I worked for many years as a personal trainer and a teacher of Alexander technique. I had a private practice. I also worked for a personal training company and had an opportunity to work with non-dancers, adults Mm -hmm. who were, you know, in need of uh, a, a refined approach to training. Often, you know, it was, um, we would get people who had been frustrated with their experiences trying to go to a gym and work on their own. So a right. group of dancers um, used our knowledge uh, of motor learning and and converted that into a you know a way of teaching that got us well paid, but also made a difference in the in the lives of our you know of our students. Yeah, so well, I think the gym is another place where people do a lot of rote stuff. And I know I've been to those classes. Right. Yoga exactly. classes are, exactly. it can be really like just doing the forum. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think, you know, then when you have the benefit of a teacher or an instructor who, who sees you and sees what you, what your next steps might be hmm. to become more, uh, to become more skillful. You know, I think this phrase that you've been using, the the person who can see what you could become. Yeah. And I think one of the things that Irene writes about in her book, which is called Taking Root to Fly, is that to, uh, to, to learn how to identify achievable goals step by step, Mm. And that's where that outside eye for you as an actor, for anyone who's a dancer or musician, you know that the outside eye is essential to the training of a performing artist. And so um, somebody who can assist you with those appropriate uh, achievable goals step by step in order to become uh, to be to master your craft. I um, one of my favorite uh, quotes from Benjamin Franklin, of all people, he talks about the sausage method. He says that you, you know, if you have this enormous salami, but you don't eat it that way, you take little tiny slices and that way it works. (laughs) And I think most of life is like that. But um, 
Slice by slice, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And 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 indeed, it is really helpful to have somebody looking at you from outside. Um, and I, you know, because I've been through all sorts of different uh, training for different things. Because um, I've done other things in life, like like a, be like a, be a computer programmer and stuff. But the training. Uh, and good training is not easy to find. Right. Because mostly what the people who are doing training do is, you know, what they learn to do. And looking and really looking at the person you're dealing with is, uh, that's a, well, it's harder and it's also, you know, it means you have to come up with something. And <laughs> yeah, I think that's where, you know, Another thing that I should say is that in when I was at Tisch <clears throat> and I had first encountered Alexander Technique, my teacher, who was also one of my dance teachers at, at Tisch, um, was my Alexander teacher. And I, I was having like I would just have these epiphanies every session, mm -hmm. you know, it was like the world was just opening up. And at one point she said to me, you know, you seem to really, really love this. I think you should consider learning how to teach it. Mm. And that stuck with me, you know, that really stuck with me as a kind of guide that if there's something that you really love, that's been really meaningful to you, that is a decent basis on which to decide to teach, learn how to teach that subject, how to teach yeah. that method or approach, right? When it's been so meaningful to you, it doesn't mean that it will be meaningful to your students in the same way that it, it is meaningful to you, but that serves as a point of departure. Mm. Well, and also there, I, I'm, I have noted in my life when I've tried to teach people to something that if I, the the way to really understand something, is to have to teach it to someone. Yes. Because until then, you don't know what you don't know. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And so, in the case of my three teachers, you know, who were very well, more than that, but. The teachers who were very formative for me as a young adult, Irene Dowd, Sarah Rudner, both of these very brilliant artists and educators were extremely relaxed about not knowing stuff. So you would say, well, how do we do this? And Sarah would say, oh, gee, I don't know. I don't think I can do it. Let's try. You know, and there was no mm -hmm. shame. There was no heaviness about it. It was very cheerful. Like, oh, I don't know. Right. And Irene, the same. If you ask Irene a question, almost always the first thing is she'll say very cheerfully, oh, I don't know. Let's think about that. Right. So I think that the there are some some very heavy sort of rigid ideas about um, one is supposed to know stuff. And there are sort of like uh, tensions or even a kind of shame when one doesn't know that mm. actually interferes with learning. It, it shuts you down in terms of your curiosity, in terms of your problem solving. If you're feeling terrible about not knowing something, you're less free to say, huh, how does that work? I don't know about that. Well, I, I see that all the time in the way, well, the way we teach all sorts of things, uh, arithmetic. Uh, and, you know, the, the most horrible thing is to get the wrong answer, which really isn't that, you know, flailing around and getting a lot of wrong answers means you might actually figure out how to actually do it. Right. And to any, if I, I um, had a, a close friend who was a high level mathematician, you know, sort of mm -hmm. PhD solving yeah. And I think most of his time was taken up with failed problem solving. You know, yeah. it was like failure, 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 thousands of failures and the occasional success. Oh, if, you, if you're on the frontier, almost everything you're going to do is figuring out how not to do that. 
uh, that was Thomas Edison said that. He, he, I think, he, and I've heard the number anywhere from a thousand to ten thousand that the, he had learned ten thousand ways not to make a light bulb that worked. And right. but unless you do that, you don't find the one. And right. exactly. So I'm um, a couple things. Uh, since one of our masterworks commitments is towards helping people find that path from student to professional. Um, and gee, wouldn't it be one nice to be able to make a living, <laughs> um, which is a challenge. Uh, our society doesn't make that easy. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I think, you know, to be an artist in the United States, which, you know, that has been my, my conditions that, um, it is actually uh, challenging and ultimately one has to be willing to um, uh, improvise a lot. Yes. Um, and to recognize that you have to learn how to get paid. Yes. And sometimes you get paid for doing stuff that's related to your work as an artist. And sometimes you have, you get paid for stuff that's less related. Like right. I worked, I cleaned apartments in New York city. I worked as a bookkeeper yeah. for many years, you know, uh, not full time. Yeah. But, you know, I had, I, you often had three or four part-time jobs that I would do that allowed me the flexibility to um, make it to a bunch of different rehearsals and class and, you know, those kinds of things. So I think that currently in the U S and probably in Europe as well, if you are looking for a very kind of um, predictable life, the artist's life is not like that. No. Um, although I think in Europe, there are certain arts that are easier. I mean, um, you know, every medium-sized town in Germany has an opera house with actual performing in it. And it's subsidized. Right. And um, I don't know. We I, I happen to live in a town that's sort of an, an anomaly. I uh, went to a wonderful concert last week. Uh, we are the smallest town in America that has a professional symphony orchestra. Oh, my gosh. That, that's amazing. Yeah, we're 25,000 people, and we, but but we're near enough to New York, so we get really good people. So Wonderful. anyway, but um, I don't know. I For some reason, a book I read a very long time ago, and I, I probably it would bear rereading, Sinclair Lewis wrote a book called Babbitt about middle America uh, values and society. And um, the um, there isn't much room for doing anything off the beaten path in that world. Well, yeah. I, and I, and I think, you know, um, there was a fair amount of consternation from my mom, I think, uh, when I decided to leave Tufts, when I decided to dance in a company and sort of make ends meet by working at various jobs and yeah. um, then moving to New York and going to Tisch and kind of making, you know, uh, making that, um, pursuing that, um, she had no understanding of how one would survive as an right. artist. I didn't either. So, you know, it was really inventing as we go. And I think, um, you know, to her credit, as she always did, she, she really just didn't, uh, she did not, um, interfere with my attempts to figure this out yeah, so well, that's i was very grateful for that I, and i was going to say that's a huge plus yeah yeah because many was, people don't have parents like that right right and so i think that's where you know there are times when a family is not prepared for the uncertainty that a life as an artist um promises Right. And well, uh, they want to know you're OK. And, right, of course, yeah. and and if you're inventing your life as you go along, there's a lot of times when you you're hoping you'll be OK. That's right. <laughs> and, That's right. Yeah. Anyway, So 
last couple of things that Todd put on this piece of paper here, uh, and they're good. Uh, one is the is there some piece of advice or some I don't know mentoring moment um, that young dancers should know about and should hear or experience? Yeah, I think um, a couple things that uh, there's a reason why you're drawn to dancing. Mm -hmm. There are reasons why you're drawn to dancing. And um, sometimes it's sheer pleasure and sometimes it's very, very challenging. Mm. And in a way, I think dancing as well as choreographing, these are things that you do because you have to, you mm -hmm. know? And um, because it's an uphill, it's an uphill climb. It like, it, it's, it's, it's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. And so I think to trust your instincts and to trust your judgment, about whether this is what you want. Right. You know, and I think sometimes we don't know. And that's where, that's where the occasional luck or opportunity comes in. And just as you're thinking, oh, I just, I'm not getting anywhere. I don't feel right. Somebody says, I'm working on this project and I think you would be so great in it. Are you mm -hmm. up for doing that? Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes there will be pay for it and sometimes there won't. I think the another thing that I will say to young artists is that there are things you get paid for and things you don't get paid for, but it yep. doesn't really correlate with the value of that work it's to you so or to anybody else. So yep. don't get too don't get too hung up about um, about how mm -hmm. much the money and the value are lining up. Because sometimes they don't almost at all. Um, exactly. A, 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 a man who was a local resident here, the actor Robert Vaughn, uh, a, a man from uncle, uh, supposedly in at, on, at his dressing stand in the dressing room for that, he had a picture of himself playing Hamlet in college. And he had below it, he had a picture of him as Napoleon Solo. And one of them, the one on the top was labeled art. And then the one below was lab labeled commerce. <laughs> and you have to do commerce sometimes. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, yeah. so the last question here. Um, oh, wait, I, there's one other thing. There's one other oh. thing I want to say, which is, you know, um, oh, that word of advice. It's along the same lines, but follow your curiosity. Mm. trust your curiosity your curiosity is worth trusting yes yeah even if it leads you into computer programming as it did me for a while exactly. um yeah the um so the other thing to ask is what are you working on and what do you have coming up that we should all know about well one thing that i am um that I, that I have sort of just recently come into is I was approached by a very, um, a very well reputed academic publisher asking me if I would like to write a book. Okay. And I love writing and um, uh, it's very arduous process, but I am contemplating the possibility of uh, writing something Um either a monograph or putting together uh, a, uh, a an edited collection of writings, uh, which I would be one of a number of contributors and I would be responsible for deciding who the contributors would be in the theme of the book. So that's interesting. Um, I am also uh, working on two new performance things one with an artist who is in the hudson new york area sandra loring 
Okay. Um, a very, very brilliant dancer and artist and um, teacher who uh, I, we've, we've begun collaborating on um, some performance projects that Sandra has had in the last few months. And it's been very fruitful and interesting. So I think that's the beginning of additional uh, collaboration. And then there's a new project that I'm working on with a longtime collaborator of mine, um, uh, Patricia, Patricia Hoffbauer. Um, and uh, we had a developmental residency of work this past summer with um, she and I and a group of four other dancers. And I think we will continue to work on it um, okay. in the next year or so. All right. Well, so we know that if we want to follow what you're doing, we can go to PeggyGould.com and uh, find out what's up with you lately. So, uh, and everyone should do that. I will eventually, I'm still learning this YouTube thing, and I, I'm trying to learn to put links at the ends of these things so people can just click on them. And uh, every time I think I've learned it, I discover that what I was doing didn't work. So back to the drawing board. I, I really wish somebody would write down what the process is, as opposed to that you learn it from some video, because it would be nice to have what the things are. But we'll get there. Anyway, so uh, Todd, if you would like to rejoin us, um, well, I have to go back here. I have to go over to attendees and I have to promote Todd. And now if he turns on his camera again, Oh, come on. Failing that, I will, <laughs> I'll just say that the uh, Masterwork Music and Art Foundation has been in business for good grief. Uh, it'll actually be in three years. It'll be 75 years. And, wow. uh, and uh, started in a living room in Whippany, New Jersey. Uh, by a bunch of women who thought, gee, it would be really good if there was a professional chorus. And that's how I, that's how I got sucked in. I auditioned for the chorus at age 15. Wow, how and I'm cute. still here. <laughs> anyway, well, this... there's Todd. Welcome back. So <clears throat> thank you. And thank you, Joe. That was a wonderful interview. Uh, Peggy, um, I feel like I'm actually going to go back and rewatch this a number of times. Um, <laughs> you're so full of uh, wonderful insights and advice um, uh, for all of our viewers out there and people who stumble upon this video. Um, we'll have this up on our um, website and our YouTube channel and from Facebook where you can always follow us and keep abreast of all we have going on. Uh, but for you, Peggy, I, I want to say that, you know, um, I feel so fortunate that early in my, as a young man, and as an older man, you know, I had these two really wonderful experiences with you. And, but something I haven't told you is that, you know, after I first met you, um, I, I would like to say I was um, inspired by you, but I think the word was probably intimidated. Um, you were such a <laughs> fantastically impressive, um, you know, person and dancer. And I remember watching you dance and just thinking, oh my gosh, it's like a, you know, another human, you know, like a person from another planet. And, um, but, you know, <laughs> as humble as it, it it seems for me to share, that really triggered an interest for me that led to this, you know, experience with dance that was life changing for me and changed the way I looked at the world and the way that I looked at myself in the world and continues to like really inform uh, my outlook in wonderful ways and unexpected ways. And so much of what you shared tonight really reflected on that um, and, and kind of made sense of that for me. So I, I, I thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> and, oh Todd, Todd. Okay, so, you know, Todd is a brilliant performer, one of the greats. And um, 
you know, when I when we first met, and again when we met in the more recent project, I I always love the qualities that you brought to your performances, and I think you're an amazing mover, amazing dancer, and just your you know your generosity, your heart, your brilliance. There's no there's no barrier. They really come through. So. I think, you know, one of the things that you and I share is a recognition that there's actually room for and a need for every single one of us, that the unique mm -hmm. qualities of every single one of us enhances and enriches the entirety of us as a whole. So the the relationship between the individual and the collective is this is this marvelously expansive thing. Mm -hmm. I've always felt that with you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that is so flattering. And and perhaps a, another proof point that you really should do that book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. We'll be looking for it. The um <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, all right. So I am going to at this point stop recording. <laughs>